together somewhere. Well, there they are. There's multiplication and division inside those boxes. So multiplication is basically multiply powers, division is divide power, not powers, multiply radii, add uh, angles, and division is divide radii, subtract angles. So what we're going to do is we just did integer powers, positive integer powers, which are like multiplication, and now we're going to do fractional powers, which are square roots. So also related to multiplication, but in a slightly different way. So for example, if we talk about a square root, we want to get two numbers that multiply to our original number. And if you think the way they multiply, that means the radii, or the radius, will be the square root of the original. And the angle, if you're going to add an angle up twice and get a new angle, the original angle would be half. So you're going to end up taking an nth root of the radius and dividing your angle by n. And that comes right out of the multiplication right here. Actually, we can look at the power. Let's see. Here's how the power works. We take the radius to the nth power and multiply the angle by n. So right from there, we could get the uh, one of the roots. So we're looking at complex roots. So when I say roots, that is z to the 1 over n power. So we're not going to look for integer powers. We're going to look for reciprocal integer powers. So 1 half is the square root, 1 third is cube root, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So if we just apply naively the power formula, wherever it is, just had it on the screen, that right there, I'm just going to replace n by 1 over n. So we have z to the 1 over n equals r to the 1 over n e to the i. Now before it said n theta, so this is 1 over n times theta. So I'm just replacing n with 1 over n. That's all. So this is one of the roots. So this is called the primitive root. The other roots are more sophisticated than this root, but this is the original one. Of course, you can write, if you want, you can write the uh, nth root like this, the square root symbol with an n. Hopefully you've seen that before. You've seen that with a the number there, like a third root, fourth root, fifth root. All right. and. I'm just going to write theta over n right here. So you take the nth root of your radius and not the nth root of your angle, but your angle divided by n. There's no use. Yeah, my n's sort of look like u's depending on how you look at them. Uh, my u's generally either look like this or like that. So they have a big open space at the beginning of them. Whereas my ends sort of look like that, except they, oops, they have like a closed space in the, in the, middle, in the front part. So they can look similar. All right, primitive root. Graphically, what's happening? You have some radius and some angle. So the primitive root, I don't know if, if the radius is big, if you take a root, it gets smaller. If the radius is small, less than one, you take a root, it gets bigger. So I can't necessarily say the new radius will be bigger or smaller. Depends on how big this one was compared to one. If, yep. 
absolutely. <laughs> So all I'm going to do, let's forget about R. I'm just going to take it out. Let's just say at the moment it's one. One's nice because every nth root of one is one. So any number of ones multiplied to give you one. So we'll just assume our radius is one to make it easy. So we're just going to pay attention to the angle. So what happens if we have a, let's say a third root? So this is the number z. I want the third root of z, which is z to the one-third. What happens to our angle? What happens to our angle here? Divided by three. So we see what our angle is. I'll just do my best to chop it into thirds. And our new, our new angle, we will write right about here. And this angle, will be theta over 3. So did my best to trisect that angle, and that'll be theta over 3, let's say. So this z to the 1 third is actually this blue point right there. So that's z to the 1 third. Probably should have written it in blue as well. There we go. So that is the third root of z. So graphically, that's what's happening. We're just cutting our angle into thirds, fifths, whatever root we want to take. Square root, cut it in half. So let's start out with some easy numbers. Let's look at, oh, let's, we can go even easier than I. What about one? Let's look at, what is the square root of one? One. Because, not because you said so, but because one squared equals one. We don't really know too much about the square root other than the thing, uh, when we square root something, we would better square that and get back to where we started. What other number squared equals one? Negative one. So one squared is one, negative one squared is also one. So square root one is really uh, if you think about the square root function, the way we treat it, we only take the uh, positive value generally out of there. Because if we don't, we would have not have a function anymore. So we're broadening the definition of the root a little bit. So we're going to have multiple outputs. Let's do the fourth root of 1. So give me some numbers to the fourth power that give me one. Some of these are very easy. What's the easiest one you can think of? One, very good. What's it? Negative one, very good. Now it gets more tricky. You're keeping it real. You don't have to keep it real anymore. So if we scroll way up somewhere, we did all these powers of i. And we all said i to the fourth is 1. So down here, better still be 1. i to the fourth is 1. There's another number to the fourth power that is equal to 1. Negative i. Why is that? So we could write negative i to the fourth is negative i squared negative i squared. And what is, so I can ignore the negative sign, although if you want to, we can keep them around. So negative i squared is negative, negative, negative i squared, if I keep all my negatives around. Don't really need to do that. You know, three negatives make one negative. And I get the same thing here. I'll be a little less silly and just write negative i squared. So there's really three negatives because it's negative. Wait, three negatives? What am I talking about? Two negatives. Wow. There we go. Negative i times negative i is positive i squared. Or you could write it as negative negative i squared. And of course, that's positive i squared, positive i squared, which is i to the fourth or regular one, or you could write negative one, negative one, 
and you get regular one. So there's lots of ways to show that's regular positive one, not negative one. So that was a little bit more outside the box thinking right there. Let's look at geometrically what's actually happening here. So we looked at the original was a fourth root of one. It's very easy to graph one. One is right here. Your angle zero, go over one, you're right there. All right, let's graph the other four. The other four are I negative one. negative i. Now this happen I'm going to draw a circle connecting all these right here. That'll happen to be a unit circle because we're exactly one radius one right here. But I'm going to connect these with the circle. It turns out all of your roots are going to be on this circle and they're all going to be evenly spaced. And if you have fourth root, you're going to have four roots, uh, first, second, third, and fourth root. So you're going to get the exact same number of roots as it looks like you should get. So if you have fourth root, you should be getting four roots. If you have a square root, you should be getting two roots. So what do the two roots look like in the previous problem? We did a square root of one. This is a little bit more boring. One and negative one. You can connect them with the circle, and they are evenly spaced on the circle. So uh, that's not the best circle, but you get the point. They're evenly spaced out on the circle. So let's find the primitive. third root of 1 minus square root 3i. Oh, that won't have a nice radius. I think if I divide everything by 2, we should, be, we should have a nice radius of 1. If you write it as a point, you could think of it like this. And that should be a very familiar spot in the unit circle. It's got a negative in it, but that's okay. It just means they're not in quadrant one. So the radius should be pretty easy to get is one. I picked it so it would be one. If I graph this out, I'm definitely in the third quadrant, I have, or fourth quadrant, I have a positive x, negative y. So it graphs out like that. What angle do we have right here? Almost. Negative pi over three. So our angle is negative pi over three. So in polars, this is 1e e to the i, negative pi over 3. Once we have it in Euler's form, it's very easy to find the third root. We just apply one-third power to everything. 
So z to the one third is this number. I'm not going to write the one anymore. I'm just writing it e to the i negative pi over three to the one third power using regular algebra rules, nothing special. You're multiplying power, so it's negative pi over three times a third. So powers of powers are products. This is e to the i negative pi over nine. This is the primitive root for the number we just graphed. So you just take that angle and cut it into three pieces. We're making it three times less. So I'll graph all of our roots in blue. So the one uh, pi over nine, do your best to graph that. It's not uh, one that we usually use, a little less than negative pi over six, so I'll just say it's right about there. I need it a little shorter. So that angle is negative pi over nine. I'm not worried about the radius. I chose it to be one, so when I took the third root of one, I just get one. So I'm choosing the radius on purpose to be a nice number. So any questions on this? z to the one-third right here. So make a dry circle with this radius right here. So we saw the radius is one, so just draw a unit circle here. Make sure this point's on your unit circle. So I want you to build a bicycle wheel with spokes, and I better use a different color for spokes. That's a little one, we'll go with the big one. All right, so I'm gonna draw pink spokes on my bicycle wheel. The only problem is you have to use that first one as your first spoke. So build a bicycle wheel with three spokes, and you better space them out evenly or you're gonna have a really bad bicycle wheel. Here's a really bad bicycle wheel. I would not ride on that wheel. So give me a good three-spoke bicycle wheel. It's got to be strong spokes, so I'm true and really bold. So it probably looks something like that right there. We'll find the precise values of these in a minute. So it's going to look kind of like that. Occasionally, you might have to draw a two-spoke bicycle wheel. That would never actually work in real life, unless your spokes are really strong. But uh, the same theory holds. All right, how do we figure out the angles on those other spokes? So I'm going to make some measurements in pink. The pink measurements are from the actual spoke to spoke. Almost. So what do you think this measurement is right here compared to a rotation? How much of a rotation is this angle that I just drew? One third. So one third of two pi. So we'll just say two pi over three. And how about the next angle that I drew in purple or pink? So, well, it depends, yeah, so it depends on how we measure. If I measure all the way from our original starting, that'll be four pi over three. Or if I just go from the last one, it'll be two pi over three. So let's go from where we started, four pi over three. And I could measure the last one, but if I can draw the angle, but that's just two pi. That's a, rotate all the way. Now I drew these angles in pink for one important reason, and that is they're not measured from the correct starting place. 
They're measured from the pink spoke, the primitive root. They're not measured from the x-axis. So let's switch over to the black marker and write down the actual, what the angle should be measured the correct way. Ooh, that 2 pi over 3 is in my way now. So I'll write 2 pi over 3 up here. So I want to know this angle. It's similar to 2 pi over 3, but it's measured the correct way. So how is it different from 2 pi over 3? Yep, it's 2 pi over 3, but you have to account for where you started, which is minus pi over 9. So I'm going to write it as, let's see, let's go negative pi over 9 plus 2 pi over 3. So we're starting at the offset and then going a third of a rotation. And in the black marker, again, I will label the correct measurement of the next spoke. What angle did I just label to the second spoke? So yeah, we'll, we'll take negative pi over 9 and then add 4 pi over 3 to it to get there. And of course, our first one, if I label it in black like these, the first one is negative pi over 9. That's our primitive. So this procedure is exactly how we are going to start with our primitive root and get the other roots that are evenly spaced out. So we're going to take our original angle and then think about, all right, what's a full rotation? And then break that into, in this case, three pieces. I needed three spokes. So I need to go a third of the way. If I wanted to go four pieces, a fourth root, somewhere up here, we did that. So you pick your primitive root, and you measure half or a quarter rotation from each of those. And they're all spaced out a quarter rotation. So it'd be nice to have a really big, ugly formula for this. So we'll write that down now. So it's going to be really similar to the first one we had. There's only a small amount changing. So this is for all the roots. So of course we get r to the 1 over n, e to the i. Now it's going to get more complicated in here. We have to take our original theta divided by n. So that's how we get our first primitive root. Plus, now we are going to have a 2 pi k, but the problem is we don't want to add full rotations. We want to add uh, an nth of a rotation. So 2 pi k divided by n. So we just saw where we took, where n was 3. So we added a third of a rotation. And k values are very important. K equals 0, 1, 2, up to n minus 1. So you don't go all the way to n. You stop one short. And how can you remember that? Just think there's n values here. If you count 1 to n, that's OK, too. But the regular way is 0 to 1 less than n. So if you're counting on your fingers, usually you start with 1. So that might mess you up if you count this. But you have to go 0, 1, 2, et cetera, to n minus 1. It's the way computer scientists count. All right, that is all the roots. So we just took the primitive root. And then this little bit we added on was the even spacing to build our bicycle wheel up. So there is all the roots. You get the primitive root plus the other roots as well. So right now, you should be thinking, well, the bicycle wheel looks cool. The geometry, uh, geometry sort of makes sense, but does this really work? So how do you test if something's actually a root, an nth root? 
So we, yes, we'll plug in. So plug what into where? So how do I know if this thing on the right is really the nth root of r e to the i theta? So how do you take a supposed root and test it? We did it earlier. Somewhere. We looked at the fourth roots of one. How do we know that we found them? So if we took their their powers, the fourth powers, and then did we get back where we started? So we're going to take the nth power of the right side and decide does that take us back to the left side? So we're going to show this by taking the nth power. So we have our, what we think should be the root, and we're going to take it to the nth power. So I want you to take 30 seconds and see if you can simplify this down. Remember what happens with the n, it basically goes into the two exponents very carefully. And you were really just using the rule, the power rule that we had right here. So all you're doing is this rule. So you're taking that r, the whole r thing, to the 1 over n, or to the n power, and then multiplying your angle, your entire angle, by n. So we have powers of powers of products, r to the 1 over n to the nth power. You multiply 1 over n times n, and that's r to the first power. And on the right side, you multiply that entire angle by n, so you have to distribute n to both pieces. So you get n cancels that divided by n part, basically, on both, and you're left with theta plus 2 pi k. And of course, k was 0, 1, up to n minus 1. So we got the right radius. We sort of have the right angle. We definitely have the right angle when k is 0. What happens when k is 1? What angle do we have? How does it relate to theta? So that's when k is 1, we get r e to the i theta plus 2 pi. What does adding 2 pi do? So we have wherever we said our number was. It's our first number. Actually, it doesn't even matter where it is. R is happened to be somewhere down here when we did it. Where's, so that's theta. Where's theta plus 2 uh, pi? Same exact place. It does have a full rotation in it, but theta plus 2 pi is going to point to the exact same direction. So you're going to be going down the exact same direction. 
So when we take this to the nth power, we, all these angles are going to be the same angle, except they're just off by a certain number of rotations. But they, either way, they point the same way. So that is why our nth root formula works right here. So you find your primitive and then space them out. And this right here shows why it works. So I want you to find the three cube roots of I in polar form. And before you get started on that, did I talk about cube roots in polar form or rectangular form? Somewhere we did roots, complex roots. So everything I did in complex roots was all uh, polar form. So step one, go into polar form. So write i in polar form in r e to the i theta form. So I picked an easy number. You should be able to graph it in a couple seconds and figure out your angle without hurting your brain. So there's I right there. So without that 2 pi k over 3, that's the primitive root or the first root. But there's two more roots also. So the other two roots are basically a third of a rotation around the circle. And then another third rotation after that. And I chose a radius of 1 so that I could graph them out really quickly. So unit circle. Uh, I is not the original. Uh, root i is the original uh, complex number, but it's not the third root. So we'll go with blue. So we said pi over six was the angle right there. So pi over six is going to be right about here. So that's i to the third. That's the first root, the, the primitive root. And then we're supposed to rotate a third of a rotation and another third. So those can be a little hard to space out. You can't come back here and just say, well, when k, 
k equals 0, we have e to the i pi over 6. k equals 1, we have e to the i pi over 6 plus 2 pi over 3, which is 5 pi over 6. So that helps graph quite a bit. 5 pi over 6, that's an angle we know about. Right there. That's e to the i pi over 6. E to the i 5 pi over 6. And last one, k equals 2. We get plus 2 pi over 3 times 2, which is 4 pi over 3. So that's e to the i 9 pi over 6. We could reduce that down. Some pi over 2's. Is that 3 pi over 2? And that makes sense on our graph of all this because that would be the straight down 3 pi over 2 right there. So there's our bicycle spoke right there. If you graph them out, they should be spaced out. You won't necessarily get one lined up on one of the axes. That's just coincidence. But you should see them spaced out evenly if you graph them out. Yeah, it sure should be, absolutely. Yeah, it should be original. So there's good news if you don't like complex numbers. This is the last thing we're gonna do with complex numbers. Well, except to give you a quiz and a final exam. But this is the last lecture on complex numbers. So we're going to be switching to vectors. And the only real difference with vectors is instead of just two dimensions, they could be in three dimensions and more dimensions, but we're not going to go past three dimensions. Uh, the other, most of your vector problems are going to be two dimensions. The other thing is they have a, two types of multiplications. There's a dot product which we'll talk about, and a cross product, which are completely unrelated to multiplication that you've seen so far with complex numbers. So there'll be two new multiplications. Uh, dot product is relatively easy, although there's a lot of implications for it, and cross product is much more difficult to compute. So hopefully you remember determinants of three by three matrices. That'll help out a lot. If not, row expansion, cofactor expansion, we'll go over that really quickly. But if you remember three by three determinants, that will help out.